everyone and welcome to this podcast recorded and produced by the Royal College of Occupational Therapists. This is one of a series of podcasts which really focus on hearing and sharing the career narratives of our diverse workforce and highlight a whole range of possibilities in occupational therapy. My name is Hannah Spencer and I'm an occupational therapist that's had the absolute pleasure and privilege of facilitating and capturing these conversations with members of our occupational therapy community. So let's start with some introductions. Do you mind introducing yourself and your current role or roles? Okay, so my name is Odette Richardson. My day job, as I like to call it, is Head of Service for Occupational Therapy for Newcastle Hospitals. And this is sort of an operational role. And I do lots of things, including recruitment, um, CPD, representing the trust in various different forums, etc. I am also Chair of Council for the Royal College of Occupational Therapists and the British Association of Occupational Therapists. And that role is around governance of the organization, managing risks, and making sure that the organization is fit for purpose. I am then co-chair of the Angelou Centre, which is a charity within the northeast of England that looks after the interests of women and girls suffering from domestic violence and abuse. I am a member of the Northumbria Police SIAG, which is the Strategic Independent Advisory Group for Northumbria Police. And this role entails providing advice as a critical friend to Northumbria Police. I then chair the Race Equalities Network for Newcastle Hospitals and also chair the network chairs for the Northeast and North Cumbria ICS group staff networks and my final role is that of an advisory group member for the local research network um, as part of the GRIPS group which is the group for research inclusivity and participation and this role I encourage people from minority ethnic groups to participate in research so that's me in a nutshell. It's brilliant Seth it's great to have you here with us and with lots of lots of different hats on as well um, to to bring to the mix which is is beautiful. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the conversation today is around career journeys and thinking about your occupational therapy career, your experiences in getting to this point. Um, I found it quite helpful to use the the cower analogy, the analogy of um, career journey as river to kind of guide the questions and guide my thinking. Let's start right at the beginning. What drew you to occupational therapy? Can you pinpoint the source? How did it all start? So I think for me, the source of occupation, although I didn't really understand it to be what it is now, it started from a child and it started with my parents because my parents always, always instilled with us the importance of occupations. So growing up, we were told that if you're idle, you'll get into trouble. So there's always something to do and there was always um, a plan. So, you know, your days are sort of planned out. You've got chores to do before you go to school. And then your your job really was to go to school to learn and then to come back and participate in family activities, etc. So back then, it was really important to my parents that, that we were not idle and that we were given occupations that help us to focus. And so I think that's where my sort of love of occupation started, because I don't really know what it's like to sit and sort of twiddle my thumbs because <laughs> I've never had that experience. And then more laterally, coming to the UK, I came across OTs um, whilst I was working as a healthcare assistant in London. And I I was working in theatres at the time, and I was sent up to one of the new awards to collect a patient for theatres. And um, I saw OTs in action, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I've never come across OTs before, so I went and I had a little bit of a research and then I decided this looks like an occupation for me. So I I explored training. I got a place at Brunel. I trained and I qualified in 2000. And the rest, as they say, is history. So that was my introduction to occupational therapy. And here I am. Brilliant. Um, what's contributed to the flow along the way? What's what, what are the skills, experiences, opportunities have contributed to where you're at now? How your journey's kind of evolved? So I think a number of things for me, um, the first one was curiosity. I was always very curious as a child and I always wanted to learn something new. I always wanted to know how things worked and I was always very good with my hands. So I was kind of a creative person, but I, I sort of um, 
So that sort of curiosity and that thirst for knowledge, I think, helped to sort of contribute to some of the development of my skills. I've been around people who are sort of high achievers. So my siblings, they're all quite um, high achievers. And so when you have those type of role models, you try to be like them and you try to sort of model some of the the sort of um, characteristics that they possess. So that was also good. I think for me, one of my, one of the other bits that helped to contribute to my flow was working in social services. So when you're working in social services and you're doing visits on your own, you kind of have to sort of um, improvise as you go along. So when you're out on a home visit and something goes drastically wrong, there's nobody else to call. So you you have to um, improvise and solve the problem or temporarily put a fix in. Mm-hmm. in terms of um, supporting your patients or your clients in the community, and then you can put more longer-term solutions in place. So working in social services, that sort of helped to develop some of those skills that were sort of lying dormant for a little bit. And so I was able to hone those skills. I'm quite a practical person, and I call, I, I think I've got common sense, which is um, another trait that I think is really, really, really useful. And again, one of the other things that sort of helped me with, in terms of the flow, was being given an opportunity and um, given opportunities to do things that I would normally um, get a chance to do. So, mm-hmm. for example, whilst I was working at Brent, I knew I was working there and I thought, oh, I wanted to get into leadership. And um, one of the team lead posts became vacant. I knew I wasn't ready and I knew I didn't have the skills, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to put my hat in the ring. So I applied. I didn't get the job, but what what that did for me was it highlighted to my land manager at the time that I was um, looking for progression and that I wanted to try something different. And so she made, she provided those opportunities. She gave me an opportunity to act up into a team lead role um, later on. She provided an opportunity for me to do some leadership courses, et cetera. And so for that, I will always be very grateful to Linda Mann, who was our principal OT at the time. She provided me with those opportunities, although I knew and she knew I wasn't quite ready. She gave me the sort of grounding and this, and she helped me to develop the skills that I needed. So when the job became available and was advertised later on, I was able to apply for it and I was successful. So those were some of the things. And also... The next thing that sort of helped with my flow is being given permission to fail. Mm -hmm. Because often we expect people to be perfect. We expect them to just go there and do everything perfectly. And there's no such thing. So knowing that you have that permission to fail, to try something and not get penalized for it, it's really been helpful and it's helped. So you you trained at Brunel. Mm -hmm. What came next? Can you share a bit more about your journey to to where you are now? I trained at Brunel, but when, as part of my training, I had a number of placements. My final placement was actually in social services. So I knew earlier on that I really wanted to work in social services because that lit my boat and I I knew that was where I wanted to be. But I was also told um, that as an OT, one of the best things to do would be to do a rotational post. Because mm-hmm. those rotational posts, they were basically posts at the time. They gave you the foundation and they helped you to build to develop those foundation skills. So although I knew I wanted to work in, in social services, I went for a, a rotational post as my first post. And I did some rotation in mental health in the acute physical setting within the hospital. And I did some rotation with the, um, gosh, the words just slipped me. But it's that equipment sort of um, adaptation mm-hmm. side of things. And so I then, following that rotation, I knew because I wanted to go into social services, I then applied for a job in social services. So that was um, that was sort of the way I approached my OT journey, if you like. Mm-hmm. And that was the start. And where did it go from there? So from there, once I finished my rotation, I went into social services within Harrow Social Services. And there I sort of honed my adaptation skills, my skills in developed skills in reading plans and adapting properties and so on. And that to me was one of the exciting bits of social services. It was understanding how the environment um, can constrain or support 
people to participate in their activities. And once I understood that, I wish I understood that a little bit earlier, actually. But once I understood that, it sort of gave me wings to fly because I knew then that I was making a difference to people's lives. From then, I went to Brent. And then from Brent, I did uh, my, I just continued to grow and develop. And I got my first leadership post in Brent, which mm -hmm. was where I ended up leading the duty team. Um, following the experience and the um, opportunities that were given to me by my line manager. And then from Brent, I went on to Newcastle Hospitals um, mm -hmm. as head of service for OT. And I'm there now, alongside my many other roles. You mentioned then uh, around your understanding of kind of how the environment can enable or restrict um, someone's participation, someone's someone's life and well-being I guess and um, how has your environment enabled or restricted your career journey? So in terms of um, my environment enabling or restricting my career journey I it was really interesting because when I was in Brent I didn't um, I was surrounded by people who looked like me okay. who sounded like me and so I went through Brent sort of um, in a period of oblivion not really understanding what was happening in other areas of, of OT. So I then, when I moved to Newcastle, it was like a culture shock for me because <laughs> I was the only black person there. Mm -hmm. And coming from a very multicultural team, it was it took a lot of adjustments. So the environment in Brent, people got you. So the, the team I was working with, they got me. So I didn't have to sort of explain what I meant. If I was making a joke, it was understood didn't have to explain it. I could be myself. I could be as loud as I wish. I could be as colorful as I wish. And it didn't, I didn't stand out. Whereas in Newcastle, it was completely different. Um, mm -hmm. Being the only one, you, you sort of stand out like a sore thumb. So I have been in Newcastle over mm, 13 years. And I've actually been the only Black OT within this team. And for a long time, I was also the only black AHP within the service. And that in itself is quite, it's it's an interesting place to be in that everybody knows you because you're, you're very different. But also being very mindful. When I, when I came to Newcastle, my start wasn't the best in terms of because people I don't think most of them have ever seen a black person before. It was really tricky. And so lots of little challenges and teething problems and stuff. There were lots of issues around my accent. Um, staff were saying they couldn't understand and all of those things. It took me a while to understand the joy of the accent myself because <laughs> they speak so quickly. So it was a two-way learning street, really. But it's um, it's been a really interesting journey being in the Northeast. In the last, say, I would say four or five years, it's much better because we've had so much more diversity within the workplace, within the actual city itself. You can see the difference um, that it makes. Um, we've been out internationally to recruit a number of internationally trained nurses and so on. And so it feels different. Previously, when I went into a function or something, I'm the only black one in there and you just feel like all eyes are on you and you just feel a bit strange. But over time, you sort of get used to it. But I don't think for me that I've ever brought my entire self to work since I've been at Newcastle Hospitals, like 100%. I've probably bought 90 to 95%. But there's a little bit of me that I still keep hidden. And I don't know why, but because um, I've grown, I've got lots of friends. And it's just it's just strange. It's just one of those things where you feel different just because you look different. I've I've also pursued a number of opportunities within the Northeast, but not sort of been able to progress in any meaningful way. And in my head, I'm thinking, if I was back in London, I probably would have been much further on in my career than I am in Newcastle. But that's just me thinking that because... Um, I have no 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 sort of facts to back that up, but I know I've gone for a lot of opportunities and never um, been given them. So in the end, I just thought, well, actually, 
I need to stretch opportunities because I know I've got all these skills that I've gained from all these different roles that I've undertaken. And so when the when the chair of council role came up, I, I thought I've got nothing to lose. So I'm going to to go for this because it's something that I'm interested in. It's something I think I can do. I never dreamed for one moment that I would be appointed as chair of council. But I thought I had nothing to lose. I needed a stretch opportunity and mm -hmm. I thought this would really stretch me. So I went for it and surprise, surprise, I was voted in. So um, I was as surprised as anybody else <laughs> in terms of <laughs> the, being being voted in as chair's council. But it's been a real eye opener and a real, um, I won't say it's a highlight because I've only just started. I'm eight months into into the role, as you know. But it's opened my eyes to so many possibilities and so much more. And I'm really pleased that I went for it because if I had allowed fear to sort of um, keep me back, I probably wouldn't have put myself forward. What role has supervision had in your progression and development? Well, I think supervision is um is really important. And as OTs, we sort of um kind of grew up with supervision. It's what's sort of the backbone of our profession, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But for me, from a personal note, supervision is... I always break my supervision down into three three elements because I think it's important. So I think there's like the personal side of it because if there's something going on in your life and you're not able to sort of function effectively at work, I think it's really important that you can share that with your supervisor and you can get some support to help you through it because all of us have life outside of work and things happen that sometimes impact on our ability to sort of perform. So I think that's really important that you look at some of the personal elements. The professional side of things is really, really important because a good supervision session will support you in terms of your CPD, your development and, and, and all of that. And if you're aiming to sort of contribute to the profession and also to grow and develop as an OT, then supervision will help you um, in that respect. And then if you're in a, a clinical or a, a social care setting, the, the sort of um, the day-to-day -day job of supporting patients or clients wherever that's important and sometimes you do need that supervision to help you to sort of um, manage case loads to provide advice or guidance in terms of next steps when you're stuck with a particular client or patient that sort of thing so for me those three elements are really important in supervision more laterally I have come to rely on things like coaching and mentoring because I think those as well alongside supervision are really important to sort of help you as you grow and develop and I find that really really invaluable as I go on this leadership journey because sometimes you know when you're a coach you you think you don't know the answers but um, the coach is there just to kind of point you in the direction because within you you know you've got the answers but it's just having that other voice to sort of say well actually have you considered this or have you considered that and then having that mentoring is also really, really important. Mm -hmm. And are those kind of opportunities within and beyond the workspace, would you say? Some of them are within the workspace and some of them are beyond. And a combination of both, mm -hmm. I think, would be invaluable for anyone. Because sometimes you need somebody outside of your actual work environment who doesn't necessarily know your day-to-day -day job, but can bring other world experiences into the equation and help you. And sometimes it's necessary to have people who knows the system that you're working in to provide mm -hmm. that support as well. So a bit of both is quite quite useful. What about challenges along the way, Odeth? About boulders so in your flow? Boulders in my in my little flow. So yeah. I've had a few, few myself. So mm -hmm. in terms of um, boulders, I've had a couple, well, more than a couple. I've had sort of boulders like ill health, bereavement, racism, you know, the usual the usual stuff. So for my first one that really sort of impacted on my, my career journey as such was in 2016, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that came at a time when I was really, um, because I'd moved from Brent to Newcastle and I wanted to do this. I was down to do the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson leadership course. And that was like a... Um, it was a combination of academic reading and also sort of work-based assignments and so on. And I was really, really excited because I've been wanting to do this course for the longest while. So I got permission to do it. And then I, um, in July, we had the four-day residential to introduce the course and to launch it. 
And uh, two weeks after the, the course, I went to the residential. I was really fired up and thinking, this is great. I've met all these folks who are going to be in my ALS. And um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the course because it's something I felt I could get my teeth into. And then two weeks after that, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I thought, mm, this is really awkward timing because there's never a good time um, yeah. to be diagnosed with breast cancer. But I just thought I was really disappointed and I was really angry because I thought, you know what, I've waited so long to do this. And at the point when I can do it, this thing just comes out of nowhere. But I, you know, I was determined to sort of deal with it. So I went to have my operation and my treatment and... Because some of the course you could do online, I was still able to do some, although my, my line manager, my boss said to me, you're meant to be concentrating on getting better and getting back to work and not thinking about the course. The course will wait, you know, you can you can pick it up later on. But for me, I think the course kind of helped to keep me sane because it gave me something else to focus on whilst I was going through my treatment and stuff. And in a strange way, it kind of helped too. So the rest of my action learning set, they sort of... Um, they took some inspiration from the fact that I was still able to complete the course and I, I was able to graduate with the, my cohort because they said, well, if you can do it despite all you were going through, then we have no excuse. So they use it as a bit of inspiration, which is which is quite good. So that was kind of like my first boulder that kind of sideswept me a little bit. And then I had um, some bereavement, one after the other, which was the other boulders that came. So in I was diagnosed in 2016, and then my sister died in 2017 from pancreatic cancer. Dad died in 2018 from prostate cancer. My brother died in 2019 from pancreatic cancer. And then my sister died in 2020 from pancreatic cancer. So I went wow. to a period of three or four years where there was always a death and it was always a significant one. And it took it took a while to sort of um, put things into perspective, mm -hmm. but in a strange way, my 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 diagnosis helped me to do that because I felt well. Actually, I was diagnosed. I had my treatment. I'm still here. I must be here for a reason. So I kind of use that as a sort of um, when when the days got a little bit dark, I use that to help me to to sort of move forward. And it was it was a grieving process, but I think. In all of it, because when you're from a large family as I am, you tend to go through the grieving process over and over again. In all of it, the, the one that sort of hit me the most was my last sister who died in 2020. She died during COVID. And that was the one funeral I wasn't able to go to because she died in the States. And of course, being in the UK with the borders closed, we had to do the funeral via Zoom. And it was really strange because... It was a busy time at work as well, and I just never had the time to grieve. So that that took some time after COVID for me to work through some of those processes. So for me, those kind of felt like big boulders, and I had to deal with them in order to move forward. So the the way I dealt with them, it was um, acceptance. I think is a good thing because there were a couple of my family members who just couldn't accept the fact that we have a faulty gene. And we're more, more prone to um, this pancreatic type of cancer. The good things that came out of it, because we're all in the screening program at the moment. But I also know that it's, um, I still have a limited time and that I need to make as much use of that time that I have as I possibly can and to do as much good as I can. For, for all the people that I need support and so on. So those are my two big boulders. But I also then, when you experience things like racism and bullying and all those microaggressions and things like that, those can be boulders. Mm -hmm. And initially when I came to Newcastle, I had a lot of those as well. But for me, I just thought at that time there was no... I didn't know anything about our unions, our chaplain to service and all the support networks that are available now we didn't have a staff network at the time so when the opportunity came for us to develop a staff network I was the first one in the queue to say I'm in so <laughs> I, you know I put my hand up and I thought I don't want anybody to come to this organization and go through what I went through and so whatever I can do in my power to try and make that path a little bit easier then that's what I will do so for me it was about using those incident tournament opportunities and to try and make it better for everyone. Mm 
because inherently I like I like to help people and I think that's one of the reasons why I became an occupational therapist because I think you have such an opportunity to change people's lives and and that was part of the values that I had growing up in terms of my parents always instilled with me if you can make a difference to somebody then do it expect nothing in return and so those values are quite intrinsic to me and so I try to live by them Mm -hmm. each day but that was my way of coping if I didn't find the positive in there you know I could have gone on a road where it was just all negative Mm -hmm. and sometimes you just have to try and find some positives isn't it so what's helped you along the way or what would have helped in those times and uh, those darker times so for me support from your family and friends when you have good people around you who can provide that support that that really helps when you have um people with willing to just listen Mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need them to say anything you just need somebody to just listen and when you have colleagues who are really there really supportive who you know who, who kind of understand what you're going through and they provide that support that's that's been really beneficial for me being able to talk through issues so sometimes um whether that be with a coach or a mentor or or friend um i like to talk so rather than read something um or rather than say some people find it easy to sit in the, the i like to talk i like to read i like to listen but for me when i have a problem I think a problem shared is a problem halved, as they say. So I would I like to sort of test things out. So I'll say to my friend, well, I've got this situation. Um, this is what I think I will do with it. What do you think? Mm-hmm. So I try to provide an answer, and then they might say, they might show me the pros and cons and say, well, actually, if you did this, this might happen, or have you considered this? And so it, it always helps me, and you know, it's good to talk. In terms of um, time to grieve, I think for a long time I didn't, and that's really important. But also to show up my resilience, sometimes you just need to take a little time out. And I've learned I was never very good at self-care. When I started, I used to think that I had to be all things to all men, and I tried to do everything um, to my own detriment. Mm-hmm. But over the years, I've learned that you cannot pour from an empty cup, and I've learned to recognize when I need to just take a step back. Or take a break and so for me the way I cope is I I love to dance so <laughs> if the music's on I'm on the dance floor and I really don't care if anybody thinks I can't dance or not I dance as if no one's watching because I'm just grasping that opportunity I'm so glad to be alive that you know the music starts that's me I like to sort of I like to go on long walks I like to read and I like to go on cruises because that's my favorite way of relaxing you wake up in a different port every day you can go to the spa, you can go to the the shows and the theatres, and there's somebody else cooking your dinner and somebody else making the bed. So I um when I when I need to recharge, those are the things that sort of help me. Um, being able to talk to people, being able to take a break, being able to just um pamper myself and, and take some self care and so on. So that's really helped. Do you feel that you've been able to be or to bring your authentic and best self to occupational therapy? We kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Yeah, I think I bought my, I wouldn't say I bought my best self. I bought three quarters of myself okay. to, to my various different roles um, for various reasons. I find um, the most challenging one for me is the chair of council role. Because I, this is where some of my imposter syndrome kicks in a little bit. And although I know I've got the skills and the capability of doing it, because it's a new role, I kind of, um, sometimes when the imposter syndrome kicks in, it's really, it's really tricky. I've been working in Newcastle for a long time. I think my colleagues know what I can bring to the table. They know what I can deliver. And so the imposter syndrome doesn't click in um, anymore in in Newcastle because I'm very comfortable in my skin. I know the contribution that I make to the team and to the service, et cetera. But because this role is so new, there's a lot of expectations on my shoulders. I am learning. I am still enjoying it. It's a challenge, but um, whether or not I bring 100% of myself to it yet, 
not yet. I, I have a little bit more to get the process and I'll, I'll get there eventually. But um, for now, I'm making good progress, as I say. Yeah, for sure. And I like your willingness as well, Odette, to acknowledge some of that vulnerability as well. I think so often kind of leadership is perceived as, um, you know, unshakable. Yeah, Actually, it's like you're human you're expected too. To know, you're expected <laughs> to know everything and I don't know everything. Absolutely. I, um, I, I, and the times when those imposter syndromes kicks in the most is because I'm very different to all previous chairs of councils. Mm-hmm. I am not a professor. I haven't got a doctorate. I'm not an academic, but um, I've never, I'm not white. So all of those insecurities kind of come in and, and, and sort of they sit there and you kind of have to learn to deal with them, isn't it? You got to learn, you got to learn to, um, to, to sort of take people with you when you go and change journeys. Because as chair of council, I can't change the organization by myself. I need to make sure that I take the members with me and the senior leadership team and all the other um, folks who work within the Royal College. So, and that takes time. So yeah, change change is always a good thing, although some people don't like it and it's frightening and um, it's uncomfortable, mm-hmm. but it's often necessary. And it doesn't mean you have to change everything because there are lots of good things that we need to keep, but there are some things that we definitely need to change. Mm-hmm. process consistently evolving mm-hmm. yeah. have there been points where your river has turned or changed course in a way that you'd not really anticipated yeah there have been a couple for me so um firstly when I changed when I came from Brent to Newcastle when I moved from Brent to Newcastle I moved from Brent to Newcastle because of the breakdown of my marriage and I needed a change I needed to just get away and do something slightly different and that was one of the biggest changes. So I'm changing from social service because I always thought that I would start my career in social services and I would end in social services. Mm-hmm. And it meant a big change from social services back into an acute trust. And that was a steep learning curve because the two are so different in terms of how they work. So mm-hmm. that was like changing course really and, and doing something slightly different. Took a while to settle back into the NHS because the NHS is a big beast and in Newcastle Hospital itself, it's a huge organization. There's 18,000 staff. So having to understand how the system works and how the trust itself works as an organization, you know, it took a while, but um, that was a complete change, of course, for me. In terms of my current role, um, I I did it for a little while and I became comfortable and then I decided I needed some stretch. So Hence, I went for the chair of council role. So that, again, was another change in terms of direction. Um, this role, as you know, uh, because it's a national role, it's more strategic. Although I do have some strategic elements in my current head of service role. Mm-hmm. It's not as much as it did. So that, again, was, it was a big change. And for me, it's um, in terms of changing and adapting to situations as they go, you, t- you, you, you learn to do that because... Um, in all the various forums that I've sat on in terms of my voluntary roles, they've all been very different. Mm-hmm. But each of them, although they're completely different, they've taught me skills and opportunities and they've just given me such a, a wide range of different skills and experience that I can bring into this chair of council role. And it all helps, really. So uh, you pick a bit from there and a bit from there and it all helps to to create a sort of a, a whole. Mm-hmm. I guess that leads on to the next question. What's been most um, important or helpful in your development and progression as an occupational therapist or throughout your career? And I'm hearing saying yes to opportunities, getting involved, volunteering. Remaining curious. Because with that curiosity comes a thirst for, for knowledge and, and, and being able to learn and just sometimes just saying, I wonder why that happens in this way or something. So that, that curiosity has really helped me um, to sort of stretch myself, but also to understand how things work and why why it works. And I think if we when we lose that curiosity, it's like a child, isn't it? A child grows by being curious and exploring their environment and so on. When you lose that curiosity, you become a little bit stale. So for me, remaining curious has been a really great part of the journey and one that I really want to continue with. Being given the opportunity to fail and being brave enough to take those opportunities when they present themselves, even though you might not know where it's going to lead, it's an opportunity. So being prepared, because sometimes 
and knowing when to take those opportunities because sometimes opportunities present themselves but you're not in the right frame of mind or you're not at the right point in your journey to embrace those opportunities and I think that can be a detrimental if you take on those opportunities when you're not ready as opposed to when you feel you're ready but also not being afraid to to be stretched mm -hmm. because if we stay in control and if we stay where we're comfortable we're, we'll never grow so it's also getting that balance between being uncomfortable and stretching and growing and also one of the other things is um being able to cope with change mm -hmm. because in the last few years we've had so much changes um it's unbelievable and if you're someone who really, really don't like change and really fear it, then you'll find it a little bit more challenging because nothing stays the same. Things will always be changing and evolving around us and being able to evolve with that change. I think that's really, really important. One of the things that's also helped me is being able to live my values. Um, often if you're in an organization that's as odds with your own personal values, you get that tension, don't you? And you, you, you can't really be yourself. So finding the right organization that helps you to live by your values is really important. And I think it's one of the key, key bits for me. And my final bit is I've been aspirational role models. I like to look up to people and I like to think, oh, actually that person is doing so and so maybe I could do that too so having those role models I think is really really important. What do you wish you'd known as an early career OT prior to joining the profession what would you say now to your early career self almost if you were your own role model now what would mm -hmm. you say? I wish I'd known at the beginning of the, before I even trained to become an OT I wish I'd known the value that occupations bring to, to people's lives mm -hmm. and I wish I'd known at an earlier point in my journey the impact that your environment can have on your occupational, on your occupation. So it's um, what I mean by that is occupational well-being is really important because, as you know, we're all occupational beings and we need to be doing things um, that help us. When you have a child who is not able to play effectively because they might be constrained from a social point of view because they're in a socially deprived area, that then impacts on you and their development um, for the future. And so I wish I'd known earlier that impact that your environment has on your occupational performance, because then I would probably have done things slightly differently. But once I trained to become an OT and I understand that, it just helps me to be able to help others. Mm -hmm. But I wish I'd known that slightly earlier, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. I wish I'd also, yeah, I wish I'd also known a little bit earlier about the wealth of opportunities um, that are available to occupational therapists. So when I trained, there were three avenues open to you, basically. You're either going to mental health, you're going to the acute hospital setting, or you're going to social services. There was none of this exploration of all the different areas in OT that you could approach, whereas now... There's just so much, so much opportunities. Perhaps if I had known about some of the others, my, my career might have taken a different route. Um, I quite where that is, I have no idea. <laughs> but I'd like to think that I would have been curious enough to sort of um, explore something different than the traditional routes to OT. Understanding my skill set and where my passion lies is really important. Um, and I think that's important for any OT out there. So... If you're in a job and you're not passionate about it, find the one that's going to bring out that passion in you. That's going to make you, you know, so enthusiastic to wake up in the mornings because you can't wait to get into work and you can't wait to do what you need to do. Because without the passion, sometimes the job it becomes a chore mm -hmm. and it's not good for anyone because you're not able to sort of do it to the best of your ability. You're not able to do it effectively. So find your passion, find that niche in OT that works for you. And I think had I known where that is, I know now, but um, when I when I trained, it was quite early and I thought, well, it's either acute services, social services or mental health, no other option. So, yeah, as a brand new OT just joining and just starting the journey, I would encourage you to search for all the opportunities that are out there and find the one that lights your fire, basically. 
what's next for you, Fada? So what's next for me? I would love, I've only been in the role as chair of council for eight months. But at the end of June, it's the end of my term of office, but I'd love to be given another opportunity for a further year, at least, just so I can continue to build on some of the work that I've started <laughs> in, in the trust, in the in the council. And then I would, um, I, I love helping people or watching them grow and develop. And it, it gives me great pleasure when I see my new grads, you know, how they've flourished and they've changed and they've grown over the years and they've gone off to do great things. So... I would, I love to do that and I'll still do that in whatever role I'm in. I just like to help people to, to grow and develop. And so what's next? I have no idea what's in store for me, but I'm open to any opportunities and I'm sure that there will be some um, out there. I just need to sort of go and find it as I've told everybody else. Um, but I really, I, I really enjoyed the challenges of the, the the new role as chair of council and just wanted to do a little bit more. Is there anything else you'd add to anything we've discussed today, Edith? No, I think we've covered it all, actually. <laughs> Brilliant. It's really been a really good conversation. Thank you for sharing your story with me. I guess we've got a, a quick fire, finish the sentence question to end with. Being an occupational mm -hmm. therapist is? Is a privileged spot to be in because you can make such a difference to people's lives. You can empower them to make meaningful changes to their lives and it's a privilege. Brilliant, it's a lovely way to conclude. Thanks for, thanks for talking with me today, Ada. You're very welcome.